After the infamous mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous period, only one lineage of dinosaurs managed to make it through to the Cenozoic, the birds. But the time of dinosaurs was far from over. During the Cenozoic, the avian dinosaurs continued to diversify in all sorts of wonderful ways, and one of these paths led to some absolutely giant birds of prey, the Teratorns, literally meaning the monster birds. Teratorns, the common name for members of the Teratornithidae family, are quite the paleontological superstars, with species such as Argentavis magnificens being pretty well known by those interested in ancient life. One of the things that makes Teratorns, and particularly Argentavis, so famous is of course the assertion that these animals were some of the largest flight-capable birds that ever lived, with wingspan estimates for Argentavis being claimed at 6 to 8 metres, or about 20 to 26 feet and mass estimates of between 65 and an incredible 120 kilograms, far larger than any other flying bird we know of. But, as we'll see, some of these figures might be just a little exaggerated. However, it doesn't take away from the fascinating biology and ecology of these massive birds, our understanding of which has, in more recent years, undergone somewhat of a revolution. In addition to Argentavis, which is known from fossils found in late Miocene-aged rocks in Argentina, there are quite a few other gigantic birds included within the Teratorns, such as the 25 million year old Taubatornis from Brazil, the North American Aelornis from the Pliocene and Pleistocene, and the Pleistocene genus Teratornis, the best known of all Teratorns thanks largely to the remarkable fossils of this bird found preserved in the Libria tar pits in California. The Teratorns were a relatively quite late surviving group, only dying out about 11,000 years ago, and they've been discovered to be closely related to the New World vultures, the family Cathartidae. Cathartids have recently been reclassified in a couple of different positions amongst living bird groupings, and they may either be in their own order Cathartiformes, or possibly members of the order Accipitriformes, the group that includes most birds of prey, other than falcons and owls. The extinct teratons were therefore very closely related to the Accipitriform birds of prey, or actually Accipitriform birds of prey themselves. As I've mentioned, the past size estimates for teratons, especially the biggest, Argentavis, have been quite astonishing, to say the least. The 6 to 8 meter wingspans would put these birds as just about larger than the next biggest contender, Pelagornithids such as Pelagornis, which have total wingspans calculated at 6 to 7 meters and at body mass estimates of 65 to 120 kilograms, the giant teratons would have been far, far heavier than the pelagornithids. But it now seems as though these dimensions might not be as reliable as once thought, since in more recent publications several different authors have recalculated the size of Argentavis, using comparisons to the much better known teratonus, finding that a total wingspan of about 6 meters, in fact an upper limit of 6 meters in some cases, is much more reasonable, particularly since this large bird is only known from very fragmentary fossil remains. One paper did suggest that Argentavis may have had very long primary feathers and therefore still been able to reach total wingspans in the 7 meter range. However, as paleontologist Mark Witten points out in his blog post on this subject, larger birds actually tend to have relatively shorter primaries, so this is very unlikely. In addition, those huge mass estimates have been thrown into question too, and it seems they may have been put off by relatively more robust hind limbs in teratorns. However, estimates for the giant pelagornithids, such as species of Pelagornis, which are known from much more complete fossilised remains, are still getting to the range of between 6 and 7 metre wingspans, meaning these toothy birds were most likely the actual biggest flying avians we know of. Something else that, historically, has often been said about the Teratorns is that they lived as scavengers much like modern day vultures, soaring across the prehistoric Americas in their search for delicious decomposing carcasses. Well, there is some evidence for scavenging in teratorns. However, as is also pointed out in Mark Witten's blog post, a lot of the more recent research on these fascinating birds has instead found them to be adapted for active hunting, and they were not actually particularly specialised scavengers. There's no denying that these birds would have scavenged if they had the opportunity of an easy meal. The fact that so many skeletons of teratornis have been found in the Labria tar pits is proof of this as these individuals were probably attracted to the trapped, dying and dead animals that were stuck in the tar. Additionally, in the past it has been noted how the teratons would have been excellent saurers, likely flying in a similar fashion to their New World vulture relatives, and that their jaws seem perfectly suited for scavenging, being hooked at the tip of the upper jaw and seemingly enabling the birds to efficiently rip the flesh off carcasses. 
However, other studies that have examined the skulls of teratorns have found many differences between these ancient carnivores and modern scavenging vultures, discovering teratorns such as Teratornis to have comparatively more flexible and broad skulls, as well as the hooked tip looking more like the hooks found in active hunting birds of prey, and not so much like those of vultures. The flexibility of their skulls and a remarkably wide gape also doesn't exactly match what is expected for a specialised scavenger. Instead, when putting these anatomical clues together, researchers have found it much more likely that teratons were adapted to restraining small-sized prey and swallowing them whole. Examinations of the pelvic bones and hind limbs of teratons also give an indication of their lifestyles, with it not seeming likely that these birds employed the use of their feet to capture prey. This is because they don't display anatomy consistent with a powerful grip, nor do they have the very long, strong talons possessed by other living raptors which do restrain prey with their feet. The comparatively much straighter pelvis of teratons again indicate that they weren't specialised in using their feet for capturing prey items, and instead the orientation of the pelvic bones, coupled with the foot anatomy and strong legs, suggests they were adapted for walking and stalking slowly on the ground. These legs could also then have been utilised for various activities necessary for what teraton ecology seems to have been like, including maybe stamping on smaller animals, allowing the teratons to move quickly for a short period of time, though the anatomy suggests they weren't well suited for running, and probably also in enabling fast launches into the air to avoid the other larger mammalian predators of the land, as well as quickly landing once they'd spotted prey from the skies. This more up-to-date understanding of teraton biology has led to the beautiful piece of paleo art by the incredibly talented Mark Witten that you see here, where teratonus is shown as far less vulture-like than many other artworks of the organism. Instead, here it's displayed as the terrifying ground stalker and swallower of small creatures that it most likely was. So, teratons were a fantastic and captivating group of birds that installed dread in every small fluffy animal of the Pleistocene Americas. While they may not have been the absolutely gigantic scavengers that many have long assumed them to be, they were still incredible animals that personally I would love to have seen alive, and the biggest forms such as Argentavis were still up there among the largest birds that could fly, and when landed it would have reached the height of a person, which is still pretty intimidating. Plus, it must be kept in mind that Argentavis is currently not known from very complete remains, and future discoveries could always push the accepted boundaries. But we'll just have to see. Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed finding out about these birds, and I hope you learned something new. A big thank you to our Patreon supporters, especially our Dinosaur Tier supporters Darkerot, Nicole Bueno, Dominic Baffy, Mark Fawn, Alex Hawke, and George Vojtech. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.